for any Monday afternoon here at Match from HQ. Still less than 48 hours on from Artur Peterbiev, Dmitry Bivol. You were quite animated in the immediate aftermath, to say the least. How are you feeling now? Yeah, good. I mean, you know, animated because I'm passionate, I'm emotional about the game and, and our fighters, and I felt like we won the fight. Um, interesting to see the opinion of many, you know, in the arena. I really couldn't find many at all that gave Arta better to be able to decision. Online, I have seen. Um, but stand by the fact that I believe Dimitri Bivol won the fight, and I think sometimes particularly the scorecard of 116-112, rattled me, to be honest. And I just thought it was unacceptable and just baffled how three judges, not one of them, gave Dimitri Bivol that fight. When you look at the, the general reaction, listen, great fight, respect to both, but stand by, I, I truly believe Dimitri Bivol deserved to be undisputed champion. Let's talk about the scorecards. The majority of the three judges, the majority of the rounds, they did agree on mm. across the board. There's a couple of swing rounds where ultimately tipped it in Viterbiev's favour, but 116-112 in a fight that was so close to everyone is unacceptable, really. Yeah, I mean, like I said, for three judges, for not one of them to give it to Dimitri Bivol, you know, and I just can't accept four rounds for Dimitri Bivol. I just don't see any way that that can be the case. And, you know, I have seen a couple of people give that scorecard, but I just don't agree with it at all. And, you know, to give Dimitri four rounds, I think was, was unjust. Um, I thought he boxed beautifully well. I think he did give up rounds towards the end of the fight, unquestionably. And I think he should have actually been more active in those later rounds. But even with 116, 112, even if he was, he still wouldn't have got the decision. So I thought he boxed so well for, for so long. And Arthur was great as well. You know, like I said, it's no disrespect to him. He's a tremendous champion, but you know, for me, Dimitri Bivol was, was the winner. Yeah, those last three rounds in particular, I think the majority online, the judges, pundits alike, did, go, did give those rounds to Peterbiev. Do you think it was maybe just Bivol slowing up a little bit? Or? Yeah, I thought 10 and 12 were close, to be honest with you. I, I don't necessarily think they were stone cold rounds for Arta Peterbiev, but he was definitely the aggressor. You know, it depends. It's the whole argument, isn't it, of what do you like? It's not really what do you like, it's who's winning the rounds. And the problem is sometimes with you know, that style of boxing. I mean, if, if you, in my opinion, and I don't want to be disrespectful, if you really know your boxing, you know what Dimitri Bivol was doing in that fight. Granted, the last three rounds, you know, were, were better be of coming on strong. But if you look at the majority of that fight, he was brilliant. You know, Arta threw so many shots, but how many did he actually land clean? Dimitri took so many on his gloves. But I get it, if you're scoring the aggressor, then you can look at the fight a little bit differently. If you're scoring the boxing and what is actually happening, then you score it a little bit differently. So, um, like I said, where I was, one, two, three rows back, p fighters, pundits, they all gave it to um, Dimitri Bivol. And, and when we got in the ring, honestly, the weird thing was, is when we got in the ring, the corner, the corner will always say to me, what do you think, what do you think, whenever it's close. Is this the Terbiev have scored or Bivol scored? Bivol, but no, no, I'm saying normally, in a close fight, when I would get in the ring, the first thing people say is, we've got it, haven't we? What do you think? I went over, they were just like, yes! Cut, like, you know, it was just, it wasn't even... And I just said, please don't rob us, you know? And look, going back, I think robbery is a hard word when it's a fight that's close, but to not get any part of that decision and to see that scorecard. And I look in the other corner, and they're just standing there, better be able corner, like, dejected. You know, you saw him in the 10th round. You need the knockout mm -hmm. to win this fight. They can say that they're saying that so he can be aggressive. But let's be honest, you just don't say that if you think you're winning the fight. Or, you know, you can say, let's win these rounds. Let's do this. Not, we have to go for the knockout. So, it's done. It was an incredible fight to watch up close. I absolutely loved it. But I'm not going to now go back into my shell and say, oh, you know, getting a bit of stick about my... my emotion in the fight. I'm doubling down. We won the fight and we won a rematch. You mentioned earlier about how many punches Peterbio threw. I think it was 260 more punches yeah. than Bivol, but Bivol landed more punches than Arta. So for the purists and the punch that sort of analysis, Dimitri's work was cleaner. Was that the, the, the problem is with the punch stats analysis, you know, when you're looking at total punches landed, so many of those can be in one round. I mean, the, but better be have landed more punches later on in the fight. He hardly landed at all earlier in the fight. 
I felt like after four or five rounds, it was either a clean, clean sweep, sweep. Or, I gave, or I gave better BF one round. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So for 116, 112, you give him four rounds. I've got him winning four of the first five. Yep. So what are you saying? He didn't win another round. I mean, yeah. like, anyway, it's done now. And it, we shouldn't, I don't feel like we should dwell on the result because otherwise you're a moaner, you're a crybaby, whatever. We take the result on the chin. But you can't just back down and just go, oh, oh well, oh, well. That's boxing, it's just a bad result. Like in, in moments of generational great fights like that, for me, you need to get it right. And, and that one particular judge didn't get it right. I mean, you know, you got one judge gave it a draw, like Glenn Feldman, great judge, 115, 113, better be I, I don't see it, but listen, I, I know that in a close fight, you know, I had it 8 4, 7 5 being really impartial, but that's me. Many had it that way, some didn't. It's just boxing, but for what I saw, sitting there, six feet from the ring, I thought Dimitri Bivol was in control of the fight for the majority of the fight. There's been some uh, comments from Vadim Kornlov, Dimitri's manager, afterwards saying, you'll be talking today, there might be an appeal going in. Can you give us an update on yeah, that Yeah, I, I think that, maybe? I mean, firstly, we hope that His Excellency is just true to his word in general, which he always is. You know, he felt that Bivol won the fight by two or more rounds and he thinks there should be an immediate rematch. If he wants to put that rematch on, we'll get one anyway. I mean, when you think about it, there is no other fights for either man at 175. Like, it's just, it's a natural fight to make. If Better Bev moves up, that's another story. But for me, I think we'll see the rematch. And, and I think it was such a great fight that we should want to push for that rematch. Um, sometimes you make a play or an appeal to the governing bodies to say, look, we believe we should have won the fight. We think you should order the rematch. Now, there's two ways to do it. You can order a rematch or you can order Dimitri Bivol as the mandatory. One of those things will happen, in my opinion. So we'll have to you know, speak to the legal team, go through due process. But yeah, absolutely, we'll be writing to, to the governing bodies to, to request that happen. Dimitri Bivol in the immediate aftermath, very gracious in defeat. You don't see it at that sort of I top I mean, to be honest level. with you, you know, I half wanted Dimitri to throw his toys out of the pram, but it's just not him. You know, and sometimes it gets lost a little bit in his language. So, so you know, when he said, look, R to one, I'm not going to moan. Some people were saying, look, even Dimitri thought R to one. Of course he doesn't think R to one, but he's not going to sit there. Why do you need to when you've got loudmouth me next to you kicking and screaming? That's my job. I don't expect the athlete sometimes to behave like that. It's my job to speak on behalf of Dimitri, to tell you all the things that I think's right, the team thinks right. If he wants to be the perfect role model and ambassador, even better. But he knows he won that fight, but he's just not prepared to complain, moan, and listen, fair play to me, he's a, be he's a better man than me for doing it, but I'm, I have to speak, you know, when we go in that change room, everyone's saying the same thing. I'm not gonna go out and just not let the feelings know of me and the team, because it's not right. So, he was incredible, you know, and even after the fight today, it's just, look, this is sport, I will get my chance. He said, you know, the one thing he says was, I can be so much better. That was, I think, what he was a little bit disappointed. Was, he was apologetic. He, to he was, fans, because he, yeah. he felt like, he, I thought he boxed unbelievable. Pound for pound, great performance. But he feels he can do better, and hopefully he can put that right in a rematch. You mentioned there's no other fight for either man a light heavyweight, but there has been talks before, maybe His Excellency pushing the agenda of maybe Jaya Pataya mm. against Artur Baturbiev. Do you think that might be a possibility? It's a hell of a fight. I mean, look, for me, Jai Opatire is head and shoulders the best cruiserweight in the world. And what we must do now is make sure, like Arta Betabiev, he captures all the belts in the division. And that was the plan when we sat down with, with um, Jai Opatire, Spencer Brown, Mick Francis, you know, we've got this, this A team of, of people pushing forward for him to be undisputed. And now we really must push for the winner of Zerdo against Billum Smith. Uh, another champion in Mikhailin with the WBC. And then, once you're undisputed at cruiserweight, the only thing to do really is to move up to heavyweight. I think Better Biev could move to cruiserweight. Bivol, I don't think can. I think he's a small, light heavyweight. Um, and it's a hell of a fight. You know, and if he wants to, we, we'd welcome it. But obviously, commercially, 
the rematch right now is the fight that everybody's talking about. You probably expect Arthur to have a, a little itch, maybe, because you know, the backlash, if you want to call it that, majority of people do think Dimitri won that fight. Yeah, I mean, there are people that felt better be have won the yeah. fight, but most felt that Bivol won it. And yeah, he may want to put it right in, in everybody's mind. So we'll see what kicks up over the next couple of weeks and, and talk to His Excellency and see how he feels that fight might fit into Riyadh's season schedule and go from there. Just spoke about Jai, but another one of our fighters on the undisputed path, Sky Nicholson, mm. defended her WBC world title. I guess for Sky now, is she going to be looking to see what Amanda Serrano does around the Katie Taylor fight before her next move? Yeah, I mean, Sky is just making it look so easy. You know, I think she's fighting at 20 or 30% of her ability, but virtually winning every round against everyone. I mean, you know, first, Sarah Marfood, who was number two featherweight in the world, was the big test for the title. It was a shutout. She won every round. You know, a dangerous Diana Vargas. And then Raven Chapman, who's a quality fighter. And that was going to be the big test. You know, she's too much for her. She's too strong for her. You know, and, and she did it with, with absolute ease. You know, really not even out of second gear. And you look now at the division and say, where are the challenges coming from? Because the only thing that Sky wants to do is win every belt. So you've got Nina Menka, who's the IBF champion. That's a great fight. But Amanda Serrano is holding the other belts. And look, when you've achieved what Amanda has in the sport, you have to be given the opportunity to you know, move up, defend, have mega fights. But after the Katie Taylor fight, she's going to have to make a decision what she does with those belts. And if she moves back down to featherweight, the only fight for her is Sky Nicholson. And it's becoming a major, major fight now. You know, at first, it was just an un undefeated fighter chasing the big name. Well, now Sky Nicholson is a big name and it's the biggest fight for Amanda Serrano outside of Katie Taylor. And, you know, there's a lot happening in Australian boxing right now. That's, that could be a big, big fight with big government support in Australia. So just another incredible performance from Sky Nicholson, faultless, never gets hit. And she's, there's more aggression coming. You know, they're seeing it in the gym and it will translate. And when she gets that part right, you know, I think she's unbeatable now, but I think when she gets that part right, she'll be unbeatable and more exciting as well. And, you know, from a boxing performance, you talk about the skills and watching Dimitri up close, that was just, you know, a, a, a masterclass. Yeah. It, was a, it was a boxing clinic in a fight that everybody anticipated this is going to be a tough night's work. And it was a hell of a performance. Whilst the Serrano mega fight brews up, another mega fight last week brewed even further. Chris Eubank Jr., Conor Ben. Chris got his return in the ring, um, out of the way, shall we say. Conor jumped in, but so did Neymar. I mean, firstly, <laughs> That's random. What, yeah. what was going on there? So His Excellency, he loves the fight, right? Because he, he just loves the drama. So, you know, we spoke about that Conor goes in, gets interviewed, etc. And next thing, Neymar's in the ring. And His Excellency's telling us, Look, get Neymar in the middle of them. But, I mean, the guy has got 225 million <laughs> Instagram followers. So it's, it's a, nice, a nice promotional push. But I think he knows Eubank and, and he loves it as well. So next thing, I'm sort of over on the side and Neymar's right in the middle. And look, it's a fight that is going to break numbers, break records. I mean, it can fill a stadium in the UK. It could be massive in Riyadh. It's going to smash pay-per-view numbers. And everyone's talking about it. I'm getting calls now from people saying, look, oh, how do I get tickets? I said, we haven't even done the fight yet. This, this fight is going to go like a rocket. But let's just, you know, we'll, we'll talk. Let's get everything boxed off for Conor Ben that he needs to. And then we'll move forward, hopefully, and make what is the biggest fight in British boxing. Yeah, like you say, maybe there's a couple of hurdles to jump through before we get to that point. All honesty, is that a fight that will probably land in Saudi? I mean, His Excellency loves the fight. He, lo he loves big fights and he knows that's a big, big fight. So we'll see. Like I said, it's also a fight that fills any stadium in the UK. So we'll have to speak to, to both teams and look at the numbers and move forward from there. An interesting subplot since the fight the first time around, your new best mate Ben Shalom is mm. representing Chris Eubank, which will, I'm sure, throw up an interesting uh, angle to this fight as well. Yeah, I think... Um, you know, we know Eubank's team very well. They've, they've been in touch with us already about the fight. Who we deal with, don't care, really. Happy to deal with anybody. I mean, you know, 
we always want to make great business. We always want to make great fights. That's number one priority and have no problem with whoever it is we have to deal with. You look quite animated on the stage uh, the other day. You wasn't necessarily involved, but Ben and Frank having a few words here and there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, listen, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that people don't really know. Um, but listen, it's all fun and games, and I think it's good for boxing. Like, we all like the, the pantomime of the sport, good and bad sometimes. And, and, you know, right now the sport's flying. Next up, Manchester, Jack Cattrall, Regis Progre. This fight has been bubbling up for a while now, obviously been pushed back, but it kind of feels like must win for both guys mm. in their pursuit of getting another world title shot. Yeah, I mean, look, in the madness of, of Saudi Arabia, we wake up today and realise we have 12 days to go till Cattrall against Progre. For me, one of the top fights at 140 pounds, even including the world championships, and it's the key, the gateway to a shot at the crown at 140. Um, a, a fascinating clash, timing-wise, for both guys. Jack Cattrall coming off a career best win against Josh Taylor, Regis Progre coming off a defeat to Devin Haney must win for both in terms of where they want to be. A great clash of styles. We're bringing boxing to the co-op live in Manchester for the first ever time. This stadium arena is incredible. Great undercard as well. I'm going to have a great crowd in there and 12 days to go. I can't wait. It's a really, really big fight for the UK and a massive fight for both guys' career. Also great to see Pat McCormack back. It's been a long time since he's been out of the ring, but he'll obviously want to kick on now towards big, and big fights of his own. Pat McCormack is a sleeping giant in terms of British, I don't call him a prospect anymore. I mean, I know he's only had a few fights, but this guy is a world champion in the waiting. And through injury, he hasn't quite had the chance to rise with some of the other names that have come from the Olympics and the GB squad. This guy has it all. And if he can get his nut down and, and stay healthy and fit, he is going to 100% win the world championships. You'll see next week, he's got a very good fight in Manchester. This is a, a star in the making, one of the top, top British fighters, and great to see him back. Michael Gomez against Reese Bellotti, I cannot wait. I mean, British and Commonwealth super featherweight title. Gomez has got his mental army of Manchester fans. The arena is going to be a light. Reese Bellotti's just done an incredible run. That will be an absolute war in Manchester, as will Campbell Hatton against Flint rematch. I mean, Sometimes they don't always have to be undisputed matchups to, to get you the blood pumping. And that is a fight that actually, honestly, when I look at the card, even when I look at Cattrall against Progre, I can't wait for that fight. Because when you talk about the narrative, Campbell Hatton, listen, come through, been given every opportunity, right? Looked okay, looked better, looked okay again. Stepped up against Flint at really English title level, got beat in a great fight. Could, you know, take it on the chin, he gave it everything. Then moves to Ben Davison and Barry Smith, all of a sudden want to take a six or eight rounder, just get back into it. Halfway through training camp, we get the call. Bin off the eight rounder, throw him straight back in with Flint. I love it. I love, I love those kind of phone calls because we don't want to see a six or an eight rounder. If you can't beat Flint, you ain't going to the places that we need you to go to. And you can beat him. But the pressure... He's massive, but co-op live, Man City Stadium, right there. It's on, it's on the doorstep of the Etihad. This is it for Campbell Hatton, and I love it. I love when a fighter says, and the team says, no, you know what, we've got to go for it. Roll the dice. Let's go for it. And that's a 50-50 fight that's going to give you great entertainment on what is a brilliant night of boxing. Fair play to Campbell, like you say, going out of his comfort zones coming down to training in Harlow and then yeah. to go straight back you've in. Got to, you deserve a lot of you know, look, you've got to be able to look yourself in the, the mirror and say, I couldn't have done any more. Like you said, he took his, himself from Manchester. He took Ben and Barry into letting him join the team. He's moved down to, to Harlow. He's been working non-stop. He's given it everything. And if you can't beat Flint, then that's, that's okay. You, you've done it for him. But all of a sudden... It's obviously not career on the line, but it's like, you lose again to Flint. I don't know where we go from here. And that is the pressure that comes with taking that chance next Saturday. And it's a brilliant night of boxing. Two weeks later, Philadelphia, two of our best fighters, I think it's fair to say, in the, on the planet as well. Boots and Bam, co-headline against their respective mandatory challengers. Have to get these boxed off 
for big 2025. Obviously, can't overlook them. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the best cards, top to bottom, we've seen in America. You know, Boots Ennis against Judasian, we know it's the mandatory challenger, got to deal with it before the unifications. Bam Rodriguez is actually in a really good fight against his mandatory. It's a tough fight. You know, you've got Ammo Williams on the card, you've got Ray Ford returning to Super Featherweight, I think one of the best fighters in the world. Tito Mercado, Khalil Co. You know, it really is some of our top, top talent. Philadelphia, selling well, I think we're up to about 8,000 already. We're going to probably be around 12 to 13,000 again. It's going to be a huge crowd and uh, I can't wait for that. You know, November 9, of course, November 30, we're in Birmingham for Yafai against Edwards, selling really well. December 7th, we're in Puerto Rico for Paro um, against Hitchens. That's a top 140 fight as well. And then December 14 in Monaco to be announced this week and December 21 back in Saudi. So it's just red hot till Christmas. Eddie, thanks for your time.